Um, just the for just people who came in, I'm the twin brother. I'm the one who's what it has Asperger's or autism spectrum disorder. That's why I'm standing here. I'm not one of you guys. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with that, but. It's Honor, I'm you. <laughs> so yeah, so difficulty understanding if people um, are bored with what you're saying or uncomfortable with the situation or want to leave or are busy and need to like move. It's just not understanding that someone isn't available to talk. At a young age, we do not even recognize that. Yeah. Now, sometimes a bit of a jerk can recognize it and still. <laughs> 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 Asperger's having a hard time with children because children don't really pick up on someone not getting it, and so they, like adults will compensate and give you know more cues than a child would, but a child just doesn't get why this person isn't like. Really I had so some great conversations with some yard duties at recess <laughs> and, the teachers. and teachers. Didn't really interest me with regular kids. Um, tendency to discuss self rather than others. Um, so the conversation will be. <laughs> sometimes it like kind of calls me. Sometimes it's <laughs> ego, sometimes it's not. <laughs> Tell us about theory of mind. Yeah. So um, one theory, this isn't you know, there's no way to test this as much except for doing different experiments. One thing about um, people with autism and Asperger's is that they lack a theory of mind. And what a theory of mind is is that you understand that someone else's mind that's going on in their head is different from what you're understanding, from what your experience is. So for example, like. I'm really sad or I'm really happy about something and someone isn't responding, you just can't understand why they're not as happy as you are because you just don't understand that there's something else going on for them. And so that's what this kind of thing is. She's, he's thinking about her, thinking about the cat, thinking about her. I saw this was a good picture to demonstrate that. So it's really hard for someone with Asperger's or autism to understand what other people are thinking. So that's true. A bit? Um, so I mean, like, we, like, for example, I mean, a great interaction, and this might go a little bit, is my older brother, uh, Alex, he would, I mean, a kind of, it's going to go on to a topic, by the way, mother, that might be a little bit, but, this is our mom. yes, that's my mother over there, by the way, um, but a great, but a really striking example for this is um, when my parents got divorced, um, and we had a couple of family therapy sessions, um, I didn't understand any of the idea. I saw it is, all I saw with the divorce was as long as everything that matters, like my house and other stuff is, remains the same, then I'm fine. And, but, so I had no reaction, obvious reaction, and everybody else was really kind of getting to the point where the emotions were spreading, it was a tough time. And my brother could not get it, that I was just simply not reacting in an emotional standpoint to what was going on. And I could understand why he was feeling sad, but I couldn't empathize with him, and I just could not figure it out, and it drove him crazy. Like, he got really angry with the fact that I was not feeling the same emotions as everybody else. And that's quite a striking example. They're not usually as extreme as that, but that's like a really obvious example where he got really frustrated that I just couldn't understand that this is a really emotional moment. And I was sitting there kind of being like, okay, like, I get it. I see the logical reason why they divorced. It had nothing to do with me, and I still have a house, I still have food, everything's fine. And that can lead to difficulty in social interaction. If you're not connecting with someone and understanding where they're coming from, then it's really hard to um, interact. Um, so let's adapt. So this is along the same lines. Um, understanding social emotional issues or non-literal phrases. So one thing we're talking about, um, we're trying to come up with examples, just so I can give you an example. And one of the things is like, um, like and I'm under so much stress, I'm dying. Or so, like, something like that. Right. That, that can't be possible. You're not dying right now. <laughs> like, no, you're not. Like, yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> like, yeah. so I'll, I'll call them sometimes and I'm stressing out about something that's like really intense for me. And I'm just like going over and over and over because I do this, that like running over it in my head thing. And Elliot is just like straight to the point like, you are freaking out of this way too much. Like, that's not even a problem. Just like look at it like literally and I'm just like, okay. Like uh, metaphors? For the metaphors one? as well. And um, hyperbole. All of that, what's like anything that's not like what's literally right in front of you, I guess. It's like if you say it's raining and you're cats and dogs. I mean, you have to understand that, like, now I'm much more adept at picking up some of this stuff, but okay, like so when I was younger, I would just literally be like, no, there's not, it's not possible. If that was the case, someone would have to be throwing them off a roof. You know, or like, or like when someone was like, someone was like, someone was like, when someone gets really, really hungry and they used to say like, oh, I feel like you can eat like a whole cow or whatever. I'm starving. I would just be like, the acid would kill you. It has four stomachs. Don't you get this into your head? Exactly. I can't eat a cow. We were looking at that when we were, we were like looking up non-literal places on the internet and Ellie was just like, no, like, I understand. 
I know, it's, it's kind of difficult. It's like I have to go back and remember that if you talked to me when I was like 12, I would have no idea. But these days, it's a little bit easier. Like even I'll mention them all the time. Like I'll say these phrases and I totally get what they're meaning, but back then I really had no clue what you were talking about. You and can just, tell me you're hungry. Don't need to say you can eat a whole cow. Or also things like that, like sarcasm and jokes. Like Elliot said, you know, it's something we all have to learn. I had a hard time with that, but... Just not something you picked up like automatically. Oh yeah. But you know. You know. So the jokes you didn't. Um... It wasn't that I didn't always understand jokes, but if they were any, if they were too complicated, I guess from my understanding, I would literally look at them and just be like, I, I okay, I don't, I don't see the point of you saying that, um, because I couldn't, because I couldn't refer to the fact that there was an emotional underlying on the words that made them into a joke sometimes, and I had no idea. That, I just didn't register the whole idea that it was supposed to be funny. It was like, always. Didn't so, mean I didn't laugh. That's also just one of those, oh, tends to get engaging one-sided conversations. So occasionally, Elliot will call me, and he'll be like, so I just want to see how you're doing, like, how's life? And then he'll go, like, launch into this, like, 30-minute... <laughs> how are you doing? And I was like, oh, by the way, I was going to this trip the other day, and I really had an interesting time, and by the way, work was going great, and blah, blah, blah. And then he'll end the conversation. And I just wanted to check in to see how you are. And then hung up. What? I didn't have anything else to say. <laughs> That's really sweet because he's like had to like learn to understand that like when he calls me, he needs to like recognize that I'm there. And, and, and I like, and it means a lot for him to even say anything like that. So. Um, the next one I'll explain a little bit more. Um, the difficulty with eye contact in awkward moments situation. The eye contact one um, is also partially because we're we tend to have hypersensitivity and. I hate, I hate to use this expression because it's kind of like one of those people who says they can do this and sometimes metaphorical, but when we make direct eye contact with people for more than an extended period of time, we can almost get too much stuff going against us. Too, yeah, too much stimulation is hitting us. Um, we, can, we tend to, like, especially if we look into someone, we can tell sometimes if they're changing up things, if they're not wanting to talk to us, so we can sometimes get too much hitting us. That's when people say that like, you can look into your soul, so to speak, by looking at your eyes. It's sort of, we're not saying that literally, but we get hit with a ton of information just by looking at you. And by having too much direct contact, we start to get really overwhelmed. So if I'm not like, speeches is fine, because I can look around and not have to pay attention to one person specifically. But one-on-one -on -one conversations, we get really antsy really fast. I noticed that um, it, I, when, I, when I first saw the eye contact thing, I was like, that's not fine at all, because Elliot... He's, he's, like, he's talking to me, so he, he's great on eye contact when he's talking to me. He's not talking at all, but I need to know. We see too much. You feel threatened? Um, not necessarily. I mean, it counts as a threat. Uncon like, I'll make a first reference to it. Unconsciously, we see too much, and if a person is making too much eye contact with us, it's considered an attack on what we value, even if they're not saying anything that has that. It means they're delving too much into our behavior, and we automatically assume they're trying to change it. And you might go into you might go into that all later. But like you were saying that oh, ten minutes question. That's cool. Yeah, you want to finish what you're saying? Sure. Yeah. That you you said to me that a lot of the main thing for you is safety, and he wants to make sure that like everything's safe. And that's the driving. And if someone has too much eye contact, they're asking more questions than they might be saying, and we perceive that as a direct threat, and so we'll usually have a very strong reaction. And I'll talk about the type of reactions later, but. What was the question? I was wondering, so if I'm talking to somebody who has Asperger's, should I like reference the fact that that might be the case and also not look at them in the eyes? This is the funny part about that. Um, I was telling, I was actually talking to us on the bus ride. So with someone with Asperger's, um, because they don't personalize stuff well, to actually even make reference to them that they have Asperger's is difficult for them to even understand what Asperger's is, let alone make any personalization of Asperger's because that's what Asperger's does. So it's kind of like double think if anybody's read 1984 which most people probably have, but it's like, it's, we can't think about Asperger's because Asperger's prevents us from thinking about Asperger's, from being able to personalize it. So if you tell us that you're doing something because of that, we won't be able to make sense of it. You sort of have to subtly change. So you'll, you can quickly pick up, like, if you suddenly kind of decide you need to go do something else because you've realized that you've been keeping direct contact too much, that can help. <laughs> We won't even, but we might not make a direct awareness that you actually just helped us out. So it's not to be mean. <laughs> gotcha. Cool. Yeah? Um, oh, she had a question really quick. Oh, sorry. Do you always feel like um, threatened, or is no. it just like occasionally? Is it like depend on the person? 
Um, the, just like your body is constantly healing itself the, and, and destroying things and healing them up again, the unconscious side is constantly maneuvering around every situation, every action, every thought process, everything at every moment is making it so that you, your brain makes you, is trying to do every action so you feel as safe as possible. So it's not like it's saying it's under threat all the time. There's minor things it doesn't consider too much, but it's going to naturally just steer away from them. It's the same way with like white blood cells that are attacking things all the time and helping you out. It's the same way. We're constantly moving and bringing things here and there, but it's not putting stress on us, so to speak. It's a natural process. I'd say we almost all do that yeah. to, some, to some level. Um, so I think, um, we were debating the word obsession, because... We're going to talk a little bit more about it. Some it's, 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 sometimes obsession, but more, it's other, other times it's more fascination. And um, the guy that came to talk to my site class had this quote, and someone was asking him like, whether or not he understands that someone isn't as interested. He was talking about bus schedules. Um, as, a, into, like, as interested in talking about that as he is? And he was like, yes. I understand on an intellectual level, people aren't as interested in X. But at the same time, I'm like, what's wrong with you? This is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> my bus schedule thing I used to do all the time. And fairies. And fairies. And, uh, <laughs> like, not, not that it's flying fairies, but transportation tech. Uh, <laughs> but like, uh, like, another great, great example that I'll bring up, and my mother will laugh at this. Um, I found an extreme fascination with types of breeds of dogs when I was younger. And I used to call her, go through books, and just be like, this is extremely fascinating. I love talking about this different type of dog. I'm fascinated by the Golden Retriever, and she'd be trying to hang up the phone, and like, but, but this is awesome. I don't get it. Um, when my mom tries to hang up the phone, how do you feel about that? Um, I don't, the thing is, like, I get frustrated, but, or when I do that, or when I do but I don't qualify that I'm getting, well, nowadays I do. But this, I'm going to refer to most cases of a lot of this stuff of backwards in time. Um, I got frustrated, but I couldn't understand that I was frustrated. Does that make sense? I could not make any connection. I felt it and was doing it, but no sense of awareness that I was frustrated. Mm -hmm. I was just frustrated. <laughs> and I could not, and if you said I'm frustrated, I'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about in a frustrated voice. <laughs> <laughs> This goes back to that same idea, by the way, does go back to now. Sometimes I'm a bit of a jerk. I know you're pissed. I know or that I know you're trying to move on. I realize I, I get that I probably should stop, and sometimes I can sometimes I'll just be like, fine, fine, I'll, I'll let it go. Sometimes I'll be a bit of a jerk and just be like, I know this is, but I don't give a crap what you think right now. Finish my conversation. <laughs> and then it's kind of mixed, but. So I just wanted to mention that the new DSM DSM 5 came out in May 2013. And um, DSM-4 has Asperger's as its own diagnosis. Um, now it's included in a larger spectrum of disorders called the autism spectrum of disorders. And so now they have level 1, 2, 3, and 4, I believe. And um, so we have like intense autism versus just Asperger's, which is considered high functioning. Um, but there are some key differences between the two. Um, autism generally has cognitive delays. 70% uh, of people with autism have below average IQ. Um, on the flip side, people with Asperger's usually have above average IQ. Cognitive. What I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, exceptional language development. Um, whereas um, kids with autism, usually, if they don't develop language by age five, they won't. And if they do, sometimes it's a little bit weird. Um, or they do things like echolalia, which is if you ask them if they're hungry, they just repeat what you're saying, like, I'm hungry. Am I hungry? I don't know. Am I hungry? Am I hungry? Let's repeat the same thing. Um, it's thing that never happens in Asperger's. Um, Curious, or a little curiosity, um, autism, autistic kids are more interested in their own world. They're not really curious about the outside world as much. Um, I mean, but I feel like these two vary a lot per person. Um, and I learned that Asperger's, people with Asperger's are interested in social contact, but they're just less skilled at it. Autistic kids have no interest in social contact. They don't really want to interact with people as much. It's just way too much um, stimulation. It either goes, um, depending on the levels of Asperger's and depending on what the person values, because that plays a heavy role into it. Um, the social contact can be something that becomes an obsession for some people with Asperger's, where they're not good at it, but they're obsessed. That would be like me, where I'm not, like, that would be like me, where I've always been fascinated with education, but, like, I could only get a C, no matter how hard I tried. It would be, like, the same way. Sometimes they, they value socializing, but, so, but Asperger's affects your social skills. And so that can sometimes happen. But in my case, it's like I enjoy social contact when it comes around, but I don't necessarily impulsively seek it out, ever. If I'm, yeah. 
Do you have some uh, exceptional skills like languages? Um, I mean, I can. I picked up. I picked up memory. when I was when I was taking Mandarin back in high school. And we offered Mandarin in my high school. Um, when I was taking it back then, I started to pick it up a little bit faster than some people could. Not necessarily the written version, but audio. Like learning to how to tonal language. And like when I was in China as an anecdote. <coughs> In 2010, I like there were some people on my trip who had like four years of experience, and I had like two, but I was speaking it way more than they were, and and people there were complimenting the fact that I could speak it with the tone as well, so it didn't just sound like an American speaking Mandarin. Um, but we're not always skilled at social context, <laughs> so we make a lot of mistakes, but we don't recognize that they're mistakes. If the person walks away, we're not going to be mad. We're just going to be like, oh, they walked away, and we'll move on. You can memory too. I don't, I don't know if I would say like. Okay, move bus schedules. We have good memory <laughs> for some objective things. On like you know what he's interested in. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like do you feel like you can like hyper focus on certain things or only of things that are of interest to you? Uh -huh. Um. If not, I mean back then it was definitely only of interest. If things were not interesting, we really did not make any reference to try. And you could badger us as much as you want, which my father did quite frequently, but we still would not care. <laughs> we just, like, no matter how hard you try, it wouldn't get through to us. We just we would not be fascinated by something, and we would not focus on it. Um, but in some, in, but interesting enough now, it's like, even if I'm not super interested in something, if I realize the importance of it, I can naturally start guiding myself towards it, where then I become super, super focused on it. Um, and then I suddenly, all of a sudden, bring back everything that I knew before about some subject and become really, really good at it again. Uh, but otherwise, I still will tend to lean towards stuff I'm really, really good at and not really focus on anything else. We won't get diversified that much. If whatever we have is good enough, safety factor again, we'll stick with it and we will not care. And, it's, and like you said, it's difficult for people to distract you like, once, oh, yeah. you're, once you're on the subject. It's very difficult. <laughs> very difficult. <laughs> what, what is um, I'm a comparative political science major, uh, but at the same time, for example, any aspect of political science that bases things off of pure emotion, like half of United States politics, um, but it's not to bash them, but it does, when they base a lot of reason off of emotional stuff, which is what a lot of the U.S. is doing right now, please, if they change it, it would work so much better. But um, like that stuff I do not have any interest in. Like I can't get angry over certain topics. I just find them completely pointless. But that's why I chose comparative. Because a comparative is an objectual analysis on multiple different structures at one time and understanding how they work and why they got there, not based off of morals. It's not like we don't have morals, but they don't play anywhere near as an important role as for some other people. Um, so that makes sense of that. Like, so it's like I'm a politician and people ask me why I don't do a mathematics major. But I still like I still have the social and I still have the reason and stuff that goes in behind what politics can really help with, but I take a purely objective standpoint to it. It's one thing that I had not really yeah. Um, I was wondering um, what your opinion is on like popular culture um, kind mm -hmm. of. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I've been watching Community recently. And I think I think it's implied that the character Albed, you know, has like a related. Um, related behaviors, but I, I think there's also some others that I'm not thinking of, and that's why we think about the pop culture. pop culture of it all. We don't pay much attention at all to it, because um, a lot of it is social interaction and emotion and response to that, and so like, movie, I wasn't, what? Except for Real Housewives. Occasionally. <laughs> that was a popular thing, but I, but I found, I mean, that was like, I just found, I mean, that for that reason, <laughs> stuff like that, that was hilarious, I'm sorry. Tell, call, me, call me terrible, but rich, expensive women bashing each other, I just find hilarious. <laughs> I can't help myself. Uh, but what about, like, the depictions, that's sort of like, depictions of Eck Asperger's and popular culture? Um, think, but there's accurate ones, or... Let's see, um, I mean, there's, there's never been any specific characteristic yeah, ones, but, but, what? He asked me about this. And, but it was a men but it was a for example, like there's people who if anybody's watched Bones, um, the main character, played by Emma Dashnell, Bones herself, she exhibits almost all of the characteristics that Asperger's people exhibit. And she does it really well. Where it's not obvious, but you can but I'm very aware that everything that she's doing is is very similar. Even if that wasn't supposed to be a character that was supposed to have Asperger's, 
She exhibits almost all of the characteristics. She thought what love, for example, was a mixture of social chemicals. I had no understanding what the idea behind why love exists in the first place. Like, she started to gain knowledge of things that she couldn't understand why. So some depictions are, I thought you were specifically talking about like pop culture, because that's a whole other subject, like we do not pay attention to that. We're not going out to see movies constantly, we don't pay attention to any particular song preference. Advertisers would probably hate us, because <laughs> we don't get drawn to something that easily. <laughs> we don't build attachments as well, that's another thing. Um, to products? To products, to, like, except for stuff that's really, really, that happens really, really young. Like, I still have my teddy bear from, like, one years old, still with me, but, like, but for the most part, like, I didn't, moving was never a problem, maybe to some degree, but moving around wasn't a problem. Relationships, like, being attached to certain things never really, you don't develop attachment to areas, you don't develop attachment to houses, nothing really you develop an attachment to, you can move in and out of it. And I hate to say this, and it sounds terrible, but, like, even family, I wasn't as attached to family as other people are. And so when I saw a situation that was bad, I just feel like, and when people are like, you go through it, it's family, I'm like, I don't have to. Like, I can walk away from this situation, wait till it gets better, and I will come back when it gets better. But I don't have to be part of this. Because I didn't see myself as like, that's your roots, and you have to stay through it, and you can the good and the bad. I'm like, I don't have to go through the bad. It's not my problem. <laughs> they can go through it. I'm down in San Diego enjoying the sun. Like, <laughs> <laughs> my time. Um, but the other factor I just want to put on this line is that autism is very characteristically defined. It's like, I tell that because it's like, you can really, autism is really in your face. People with it, it's very obvious when people have autism, to me at least, versus Asperger's is, is very qualitative. It affects everything, but it does it in certain degrees. It affects okay. how you speech. It affects, but it's not determining what you say. Versus autism is very determining of factors. Versus I like to think of it as like, Asperger's heightens some things, it may change how you interact with another person, but your speech and what you're saying is still the same. But it's affected how you perceive certain situations. Um, some things you can't do as well as others, but Asperger's is affecting to some degree of that, but not fully. One thing I didn't know is the physical symptoms. So apparently, um, people with Asperger's have much more motor difficulty than people with autism, they have no issues. Um, but, parents, but autistic kids do sometimes seem physically awkward, but that's mostly more due to the fact that they don't play as much when they're little kids, they don't play with other kids. The motor so skills I, was actually one of the big things that caused it to be diagnosed in the first place, um, was how I reacted and how quickly I reacted to things. Especially emotions in people's faces, I couldn't really understand that as a 10-year-old. So prevalence. Um, in 1973, and 10,000 people were diagnosed with ASD. Um, 2013, 150 kids are diagnosed with some form of ASD. Um, and a lot of reasons for this, we don't really know many of them. Um, some of it is that it's changed the way we diagnose it, and we have new diagnoses that we didn't have before. Like, um, Asperger's wasn't even the DSM until 1980, so whenever the DSM-4 came out. So, you know, that's not the main thing about, but most of you don't know why it's increased. And we do know that it's highly genetic, so not caused by vaccines, just so you guys know. <laughs> I call this the popular version of McCarthyism. <laughs> there is a very small risk if you have more than 15 vaccines in one city. Um, they don't do that, that would be really bad for a lot of other reasons. <laughs> um, just so you know. But it is, aut aut most of the data that I'm presenting here is for autism in general, not just Asperger's. So just so you know. 95% um, concordance with twins, so you're really likely, if you have an identical twin, you probably are both going to be autistic, um, and if your child has autism, um, you're 35 times more likely to have autism disorder. And it usually runs in families, um, usually families are called what's called multiplex families, where a lot of people in the family have some form of the disorder. Um, oh, there are 11 genes identified that are involved or abnormal in people with ASD. They don't really know what they do. Some of them are actually involved in the immune system, which is kind of interesting mm -hmm. to note. I would love to say that I don't get sick because of my Asperger's, but I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, there's an interesting theory that um, I read a cool article about, is that it's, in some ways, um, Asperger's type characteristics were adaptive, um, and certain types of new jobs that came up, like, for example, the high-tech boom, um, working with computers, working with math, um, really structured type things, and also, like, 
have no problem working in a cubicle all day long and not talking to anyone. That's true. really, you know, asset to, <laughs> <laughs> asset to a company. So um, one thing that they noted is in Silicon Valley there's a lot higher rates of autism. And I think that maybe because they think, people think, they have a theory that a lot of uh, people with Asperger's moved to Silicon Valley for jobs in the tech industry. And they, um, you know, got together, had babies, and otherwise they wouldn't. And um, having someone, two people who have Asperger's type characteristics on like the low end of the spectrum get together and then, you know, genetics, you create someone who has a more severe version of it. Everybody gets the difference between low functioning and high functioning Asperger's, right? Low fun, like, by low, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's minimal. Low functioning means that it's closer to autism. So if that's accurate, then that is reason to, like, more evidence to say that they're on the spectrum. So there's, like, fun. Functioning is regular society-ish. Pretty classified, that is. Anyway, yeah. So, after the cluster is behaviors, it is a disorder. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we, I'll bring up this, because it's actually quite funny. Um, there's a group of people that meet at my, I work at, of Pete's Coffee and Tea Store in La Jolla, um, and there's a couple people that meet there every Thursday. And I found out that 80% of them have Asperger's. Um, and it's, a, it's called the Philosophy Club. And it's like a group of 20 or 30 adults that meet every Thursday for like the last seven years there. And I ended up having a conversation with like four of them, a much smaller group of 30 people talking about Asperger's. Believe me, I thought ram my rambling was bad, but imagine 30 people rambling from your face and trying to interfere with each other. Tell how long they go on They go on from, they start usually at 6, and they can last about 4 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Which I always thought was bad, but now, like, a couple of, a couple of us, we love it when they start to get into arguments, because, like, we're sweeping all around the floor, and they're yelling at each other, and we're like, oh, this is fascinating. <laughs> it's like watching The Real Housewives, but right in front of your face. <laughs> um, we're just like, so one of us will like, if it's kind of getting boring, we might just mutter something under our breath. Then get the popcorn out. Um, but, <laughs> but um, so they all, majority of them actually were diagnosed with Asperger's, but the majority of them were diagnosed a lot later than I was. So as soon as I started bringing up like topics that I was diagnosed, they all got super fascinated. And then I got super annoyed because they're rambling and asking me 50,000 questions all at once. And when I tried to enter one, one interfered with the other, and then and I got it. Is it true? Like, yeah. Do you have an awareness of that now? Yeah. Or maybe you wouldn't know otherwise uh, before. So it's really funny when you get two people with Asperger's next to each other because both of them are going to ramble, and the other person's going to say, get to the point, and then the other person's going to switch, yeah. and it's going to go on and on and on in a cycle. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm still talking. No, I get what you're saying. And then the person starts talking, and they're like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, shut up. I get your point. <laughs> it gets really, really interesting. I know this because my best friend of like 13 years got diagnosed with Asperger's about four years, about three years after I did. And once I realized that he and I, whenever we talk, that happened, I was like, I'm just not even going to bother. I'll let you speak. So I was, because he case, his case, he was a little bit, it was done afterwards. Of course, I had to be the one who was like, I'm going to stop talking and allow you to talk allow you to ramble and I'll cut you off when you're really getting annoying. But I'm not gonna cut you off impulsively, because I'm a little I'm much more able to control some of those factors now. So as much as my my brain still wants to. My unconscious mindset still wants to shut you off. But I force myself not to and just grumble about it later. And talk crap about you afterwards, no excuse. <laughs> you sure about that? <laughs> you don't know, I'm talking about how you'll back. <laughs> but to answer this question, finally, speaking of which, by the way, we're really good with essays because our structure is perfect. We always go back to the original topic. And we do that in our speech, too, just several like times. I did now. Yes, several times. Um, I don't necessarily always classify it disorder. Um, it really is just a characteristic of behaviors that affect all your daily interactions. It's not something that, like... How is that? How to put it with autism in a way, it's like... Autism, they do things that are just, it's not that it's really a difference in, in another type of behavior, it's specifically something they do that's only related to autism. Like, they'll repeat stuff, or they'll talk something, it's not just a change in how they speak, it's literally that that is what their brain is thinking. But with Asperger's, we take in what you're saying, and we'll understand it, but then like, the Asperger's will like, hitch a ride, and kind of control it in a way. So like, we'll ramble, and 
So someone will ask us to talk about a certain subject and we'll talk about it for a long period of time and, and Asperger's is, is essentially giving it like a really big dose of steroids. It's making us ramble on for ages because we're not as aware of what other people are saying. But our social interaction is the same. It's just that it's kind of making the situation go for a really long period of time. It's like imagining everybody's talking to us but we just it's like everybody has like walls in front of them. We can't see and are aware that other people are there. So we don't see their facial reactions, we don't see any of it. So we'll keep on talking. I'm part of one of the disorders that it, yeah. yeah. What are relationships like? Like uh, romances, are they significantly different from people they, with Um, It depends. They're a little bit tricky, especially at a young like even in high school, they're a little bit harder because we just we're not as aware of emotions as much. So that's like one of the factors. Like, well, people might get angry because we just we can't relate to them always emotionally because we think so objectively all the time. Uh, so it can be tricky. Okay. You know, someone has to work. What? Personal experience. Um, I haven't had a whole lot of personal experience with it with like romantically case. I mean, I've had a few instances where it's just been like the other person has just found like they'll say something along the lines of like. Which is usually a sign that it's the Asperger's. They'll be like, I can't put a finger on it, but it's just something that I can't get quite through to you. And to me, uh, not because I know that now, to me, I understand that that is like it's a silent like the Asperger's has affected that. But like beforehand, I wouldn't even notice. Like it's just be like, okay, it's over, whatever, don't matter to me, we'll move on. Um, but now I know that like when someone can't put a finger on it, it's because that that's affecting how I speak. I can't pick up what they're thinking, I can't pick up their emotions as easily, I can't see all of that. So sometimes people have to be direct with me, and by that point they're already kind of frustrated. So we try, but we're not always the best. But we don't put a whole lot of emphasis on it, so we're able to kind of move away rather quickly. <laughs> Which helps. <laughs> like we find a situation terrible, but then we'll recover from it really fast. You were, you were bummed. Yeah, at one point. Um, yeah. Another, I mean, yeah, I mean that. Sometimes they can be bummed, but the point being, like it was for like a, it was like for a really short period of time, and then we just go right back into what we're doing. Great recovering situations, yeah. In my recent readings, you probably know all this, but the DSM four and the DSM five are based on clusters of behaviors yes. and symptoms, yes. and it's the same pack of psychiatrists who designed the DSM-5, it's the 4, and it's largely so that they can diagnose disorders and then have medications, mm -hmm. so big pharma comes in. Yes. The NIH, the NIH National Institute of Mental Health, has rejected the DSM-5 now, <laughs> because it's not based on neurobiology. Mm -hmm. Alright? So, uh, this is, yeah, yeah, this is a big, this is a big deal. So, uh, there's a lot known about the neurobiology of autism spectrum disorders now. Do you, can you tell us something about that? <laughs> Not your expertise. I yeah. do. Um, it's it's a very differently organized brain, and there's just tons of evidence for that. Yeah. And UC San Diego leads the pack with the mirror neuron theory. Do you know about that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 But I yes. Mean, I, I mean, because behavior is organized by the brain, so ultimately all of it comes from the brain. It's not like something you just make up. True. The brain so like, makes your behavior. My so only issue if with your that. behavior is different, then your brain is different. Yeah. No, definitely. Absolutely. And then that's what's, you know, the genetics. So yeah. That's, I mean, and something some is different. The, and, and then some, well, different. they know already. I mean, because they study the neurobiology of autism, and they've seen many, many, many papers. You know, the fiber systems end up in different places, there's hyperconnectivity in the frontal area, hyperconnectivity in the posterior area, there's fibers that don't go all the way across, linking both hemispheres, there's, there's a whole different highway system of networks. It's a very interesting, fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's part of all of what they call neurodevelopmental yeah. disorders. Yeah. Elliot, have so, you ever talked to Rama? Have you ever, have you ever found that guy and not him to talk to him at all? Rama yeah, yeah. Ramachandran. The world's like the world's that. leading, you know, a lot of the what you know, the world's leading researcher like on Asperger's and autism. Well, and this is my personal two cents on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, for, one of the biggest characteristics, at least for for 
me that inadvertently internally affects Asperger's itself is that like if something didn't have a massive impact on anything, I wasn't interested in knowing anything about it. Um, and so when I was first diagnosed with Asperger's, it actually took legitimately my father to like push to me that it was changing interactions with people. He had to like get it into my head that these things were not going well or that this interaction was not being right for me to even have any remote like, what should I do about this kind of feeling. But beforehand, like we don't, if a situation isn't too damaging on our structure, if it doesn't change our safety as much, we're not going to delve into it. So oddly enough, like, it wasn't like I was super fascinated in caring about what people had about knowledge about Asperger's. I was just like, I'm like, I don't care, because the Asperger's makes me not care in the first place. You know, it's like, if it doesn't interact, if it doesn't change enough where it's seriously going to interfere with my structure, I won't have any interest in going into it. It gets really annoying when people are like, you should really go watch this movie, you should really go do this, and every single time I'm like, no, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but, if someone could develop something based on the neurobiology to help you, or you the question as well, would you want to take it? Why? <laughs> Not really. I mean, like, I've just had a case where I said, I've, until I encounter a situation where there's so much that I, like, that's going to stop me from doing, really, like, without, off, without a chance to change it, I'm not really going to have a massive case. You know, I've managed to move around in situations and probably do the whole safety mechanism, been able to get around through stuff without much problems, lately at least. Um, like, I moved down to San Diego, and Asbury's, like, naturally affected how I wanted to maintain a structure. So, because Pete's really offered that sense of structure, I transferred my job from Northern California to Southern California, and used that as a base, and then branched out from there. So, like, once I got that sorted out, then I sorted out the living situation. Then I sorted everything else, because I had that as a basis, and that made it so the entire transition was incredibly smooth. And that was like the first time I had like moved away from it, from everything, but it was much much easier. Um, Do you have a question? Yeah. yeah, I mean, sorry to. to no, absolutely. But I feel like it's pertaining to this. So you, from my understanding, you're stating that if you're not directly interested in something, and a lot of times I guess that has to do with your feeling structured and your feeling safe, then you're just gonna you don't care. You're just gonna shut it out. So I guess my question is. Um, how is your experience with school, especially UCSD? Because, I mean, my experience at least is that there's a lot of shit I don't care about. So, <laughs> like, it's not even that we don't care about it. We just, it's like the I don't care part so much isn't like unless someone specifically tries to ask us about something, then we'll legitimately say I don't care. It's that we don't even recognize any of that stuff as existing. It's like it's not we don't perceive it at all. So we could. That's why I was saying advertisers would hate us. Because, like, partially for a joke, and partially for the fact that, like, we could walk in a room that had 50,000 different signs for advertisements, and not, they would be pretty much a guarantee you'd walk out and not be convinced to buy any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, we could be in a room for five hours with nothing but advertisements on the wall, stare at them, and not take any perception of what they're saying, and walk out, and maybe coincidentally we buy something that happens to be down five years down the line, but there's no guarantee it's going to do anything. Okay. Um, because unless it really fits along, even if they were to do something that we already had, like, I'm used to doing this, and they're like, this should help facilitate your life, we still probably won't, unless it really interests us. Um, but we won't even pick it up. <laughs> I'll just stare at it, I'm like, oh, that's a whole bunch of colors, and if I really want to get down into it, I'm like, that's a whole bunch of ions, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, nothing, <laughs> I won't be taken in by it. So, I, that's a perfect example, like I'll walk down what we have is Library Walk, which is the main for like the main walkway around campus and all the fraternities and all the other stuff go along there and colleges can I can walk right by every single one of those. And some people can get ignored by them and some people get irritated, but I'll just walk through it as if it doesn't even exist. So I'm just like I can just walk and it's great because they'll recognize that and no one will come up to me. So I'll just, I'll just be looking forward, like really don't, don't even bother. You know? We don't get visual stimulation, we don't get picked up by it, we're not as receptive to visual stimulation as much, much more audio to a certain degree, at least for me it, that, that's the case. Like when we went to go see, we went and saw Avatar in IMAX. I almost passed out. That was, he was just like, no, okay. Too much like, visual stimulation. Like the entire time, just couldn't, because it was audio and visual, and like right there, just in your entire world. It was like, because that for me is like, yeah, this is sweet. <laughs> but for, I, for me, I was pretty much close to passing out. He was out. so unhappy with me. Sick. Yeah, and fairs. No. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I was like, the candidate was like, let's go to Six Flags New World. Everybody else, yay! I'm like, no. Never. Um, your question? Yeah, so, um, are you extremely decisive on what you want to do, like, all the time? Just like... Once again, I'm going to go, I'm going to, like, flip the switch and kind of go along the lines of, Asperger's unconsciously, yes, very decisive. Will not, like, in other words, like, I could basically, like, I don't have a car and I live on campus and my work is kind of about two miles off of campus, walking distance. I'll walk the exact same path for the last year and a half to work along the campus. It'll literally be the exact same path. It won't differ by much than a few feet in either direction. And I could pretty much do it with my eyes closed. Um, I could change it if I want to, but impulsively, I, I, you know, I, could, I just follow it. If I make a set direction to, to a place, it's almost as if I can't stop myself. I'm going to follow that exact path, and I cannot stop my legs from moving in that direction. And I will get there. I've been able to do it with no lights, <laughs> so it's doable. <laughs> yeah. So, does this have any problems with like uh, problem solving? You know, going about solutions in different ways. Um, in some things? degrees, if uh, it can help with problem solving, um, because you're not as like other people's opinions, you're not as affected by them. So, if if you pretty much sure you have the right answer, like you'll be able to get through that question like it was nobody's business. Mm -hmm. You're just like, I got this. I don't care what you say. And then you'll be right, and you'll just be like, <laughs> <laughs> I listened to my gut, and no one paid attention, and I got this question right, and everybody else did, and people are like, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm right. But um, we, in my case, the other funny thing was like, I'm able to exhibit cases of dry humor very, very well. As I said, like. I jokingly say I'm British, but that's the only thing I managed to inherit was I managed to take the piss out of everything, but not anything else. But, uh, <laughs> but we can exhibit dry humor and we can find it extremely hilarious, but some things that we find hilarious other people won't. Great example of that, I was reading a, um, was reading a, sounds absolutely terrible and people are going to hate me for this, but I was reading a book on the Holocaust and this guy had a certain way of describing certain situations that he was, and he did it with a slight sense of humor that I found extremely hilarious about how he was put a writing style into the thing. And I start cracking up and someone looks down at me and gets extremely angry that I'm laughing about the Holocaust. And it was just like, it was just a way the guy had structured his writing where he was kind of taking the piss out of a moment where he was inside a, he was inside one of the, um, why am I forgetting it? Detention centers. And he had made a joke to make things more positive. <coughs> but it was a very technical joke, and I found it very, very funny. And I was just like, this is so hilarious. Do you see how he's writing this way? It's perfect. And everybody else is like, this is the Holocaust. It's a very dark moment. I'm like, I'm so sorry. But <laughs> so we, we tend to find things humor. We can give it humor out, but we don't always receive humor well. It's kind of weird. The perception thing also happens where we take things out of context frequently because we don't have the same idea that it's going to drive a lot of people crazy. I like wondering, you were saying earlier. So one thing you were saying earlier, um, you know, there are people in our society that have to make sort of like executive decisions, like judges or something like that. Do you think people with Asperger's would make better judges than the rest of us who are affected by all sorts of emotional situations all the time? To some degrees, but there's also obviously that chance it's going to get a lot of people angry. You know, I mean, like, <laughs> just like, like, I get, I have this. My roommate is highly subjective. He's a sociological theory major, um, and like. He'll be watching a crime show about like some person who was like escaping the law, and he'll just we gotta jail that person, and then we'll figure out what, what they're gonna do or whatever. Like, cause it's just like automatically morals kicks in. And they're like, this person's bad. I'm not really gonna pay as much attention. Try to tell a person that when they start to use morals, it automatically blinds them, and they'll get really mad at you. <coughs> um, but like, I'll just be like, man, that person's super fascinating. We have to figure out what he's doing first before we go catch him. Like, it's like. <laughs> like so, would be, but probably be a better judge, but you don't think people would like it. Yeah, exactly. That's why I say, like, I, I'm in comparative politics, but my getting a job might not be so easy because people are going to be like, what do you think about this? I'm like, well, I can see both sides of the story. And I'm only going to, like, after taking a really close analysis while I make my decision, but no, this person is bad. You ought to have to go out and get mad at them for it. And I'm like, eh, I can't really do that. You know, um, I hope that kind of helps answer that question. Yeah. We, we're, we've probably made good judges. Um, especially when, like, 
when they say in stone that the judges do not base things off of their own party and are completely impartial, if the entire judge, Constitution, and Supreme Court judges were made of people with Asperger's, for once the Constitution would be right. <laughs> <laughs> We really would not base things off of, like, the Republicans would be like, I can't believe you did this, and, we, and then the Democrats would get mad at us as well. Just be like, because they'll be like, I still can't believe we said this, and we'd just be like, we didn't do it for either one of you guys. It was just, this was the best way to go about it, and you can't argue with us about it. <laughs> yeah, we were going out to the country, but I'm just like, yeah, I can offer my advice, I'm not sure he'll take it. But, and I'll just be like, because you're old, must be. <laughs> Sorry, terrible. But, um, but another, um, another characteristic I just wanted to bring up was, so, <coughs> we always have a highly sense of structure. We value things, whatever our structure is. It can be one thing or another. My best friend, Ismail, values socializing like no other. He thinks it's the best thing on the planet. And he's very aggressive when people have a different structure that he does. He'll do everything in his power to change them. So it got him into a lot of fights, got him a restraining order, got him in jail um, for pot dealing and other stuff. And he really thought that like, if someone has a different system than he does, I mean, he'd make a great lawyer. He wouldn't give up. But you know, like channel into something useful. But he will not stop. And it gets to the point where like you really just want to like put him in a jail cell and lock him up and not have to speak to him. Because there's moments where he just will, he'll do everything in his power to change your structure to fit his. And he will never give up. But the funny thing is, I'm the exact opposite. So like, I will just not associate myself with people who have a different structure. I just will, I will not pay any attention to them. Like, unfortunately, another case of my brother, he valued socializing. His things that he valued were different. So unlike my sister, I really didn't pay much attention to him. And it wasn't like I hated him, but his structure was such a threat to my internal system entirely that it was like a life or death situation. And I'm not saying, as I said in the very earlier, to a precondition you guys, when I say that, I'm not thinking it's life or death, like I gotta run for my life. But unconsciously, it's the biggest attack on us when someone comes near us and tries to talk to us and has a different way of thinking. We get really, really worried. The last thing we want is to lose our sense of safety. We'd probably go insane. Um, and so we naturally will stick away from them or we will do everything in our power to change their opinion. So for one reason or another, like, I was never bullied. I didn't get into conflicts with people. But that was probably because I avoided those with, per like, it was my life <laughs> depended on it. So I had to purposely adapt to any situation to make sure that no one got mad at me <laughs> and tried to change the ways I was doing things. But in his case, it's like encountering someone who, no matter how hard he tries, will not let him change your structure. And so it's this really weird case where he will perpetually chase you and you will perpetually run away from him. And it's this never-ending game. And it still happens this very day. Even with him being the same age as I am, he'll still call me and still be like, what are you doing? Why are you still in school? Blah, blah, blah. And I'll just ignore him. And it will go on and on and on and on and on. Because when we were younger, a lot of the stuff that we were dealing with was the same. And so our way that our Asperger's interacted itself was the same, and so we made a lot of friends, like we were good, good friends, we had played video games, did a lot of stuff, but as soon as middle school kind of hit and adolescence and different environmental systems started to happen, the way that I responded changed, and my structure, according to him, changed, drove him nuts. But luckily I was going to different high schools, so we didn't have as much crazy interactions, but an extreme case was like when he pretty much backed me up into a wall and was like, I don't get it, why are you not smoking? Like he thought, he thought the marijuana cure is Asperger's, but, which I thought was a complete load of BS, but, <laughs> but like he would not stop it. He would not stop. He got basically to the point where I felt literally like my, an internal threat to my entire system. And I was consciously thinking, what am I going to do? Because he basically had me pinned up against the wall saying like, why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing this? I can't believe you're doing this. And would laugh and I would just be like, I don't get why you're doing this. Like, he would try to get you to smoke. Yeah, he pretty much would constantly. And it was just a never ending case. And so that, that situation is an extreme where that's why I'd say never room with your best friends because the exact same situation will happen. But it's just, like, it's just like, you'll end up having a clash and everything else will get in the way. Where we're still drawn to each other to a certain degree, but it's never any game of chase. And it's just like, I find it sometimes hilarious 
Because I'll just be like, and I'll make some not always great references. I'm like, yeah, so where have you gotten with your life? It's not been good, has it? I might not have friendships, but I got everything else going for me. Thank you very much. I've not had many issues, I know, but we're both missing out on stuff. You know, he doesn't have the same level of avoiding situations, but he also is a great person to go out and get what he wants. In my case, like, I don't have a lot of interaction with people that go wrong, but I don't stretch myself out as far. I don't diversify as much, and, and that can have its own drawbacks at times. But the difference between his and my case is, like, if the situation doesn't change it enough, I won't bother. If in his situation, the moment's an attack, he'll rapidly change it. He'll be full force. And it can get him into trouble. Um, was there a... Yeah? Um, when you said that you feel frustration, but it's hard to recognize that emotion, would you say that that is general, that there's a wide range of feelings, but it's difficult to yeah. attach them to social media? It's difficult to, it's like, it's like the emotion is happening and the rest of me is happening and they're not stuck together. And you can't, it's like you wish you could take like a glue stick literally and just stick them so they go side by side. But a lot of times they went separately. Emotions would happen but no reasoning would go in the process. And I would, because I couldn't think about it, like I would have an emotional breakdown, but you couldn't get through to me. No matter how hard you tried, it would just happen. You know, stress would happen, anger would happen, but I couldn't explain it, and I couldn't tell you what I was angry about necessarily. I couldn't even mention that. I'd just get frustrated. Yeah, I wonder why the neural connections are different for someone with Asperger's in that way. It's like the, the two different things that are normally connected, you know, like your mental state and your thoughts and stuff and your fits and your emotions. Usually they're connected, but in that way it sounds a little different. They're not always. I mean, I get, I'm much better at it nowadays than I was before. Um, and one of the things that like happened in my case was when I went to high school, I got cognitive behavioral therapy for all four years, once a week. And it was one of those things, and cognitive behavioral therapy is really effective for teaching you to be aware of things you cannot always control. And a lot of what Asperger's happens is stuff you really have no control over. It is not something you can see happening in front of your face. Um, and, um she would she would not give up. She would put me in a situation where she would purposely ask me questions. What is going on? What is going on? What is going on? And she wouldn't give up. Because obviously, I mean, it's her job as well, but she was just like, she was forcing you at times, and believe me, it brought out a lot of anger. There were times where I hated her to death, and there were times where I thought breakthrough was happening, you know, and there were times where she's like, we're going to meet on Tuesday. I'm like, oh, hell no. I'm not seeing you. You're driving me nuts. But, <laughs> but there was other days where I was like, oh my god, I'm so glad that I have her. And those started to happen more often where I was like, I'm so glad I'm going to the meeting because I started to realize that like, by purposely forcing me to say, I'm angry, that itself was more than I could ever do before. By actually legitimately making connection that me is angry, not just angry is happening. It was, it sounds strange, but that's how it was, you know, it was anger, happiness, joy was happening, but I wasn't aware that it was happening, it wasn't inside, it was just inside. Um, but in, in those instances, when those feelings are happening, is your logical processing the same? Are you still very objective, or? Uh, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> it's like, you'll, you'll be talking, it's the case where, put a great example, you don't always, like, raising your voice because the situation is making you mad. Um, the person will ask you why you're raising your voice, and you can't explain why. Um, you are frustrated about what the person's probably saying, or you're frustrated with what they're doing, but you'll still be like, but that's not what I'm talking about. Like, I'm going in this direction, but you're really, no, but I'm going in that direction, you won't, they'll be so separate with each other. You'll still be talking objectively, and you'll still be on topic, and you won't even always be aware that you're angry with the person, but your voice is raising because they're annoying you. Um, but think of it as like, the emotions are happening, and the brain is like, is not picking it up at all. The brain's just, it's not, it's like somehow there's like a drawbridge and it's not opening when the emotions are happening. The brain's just thinking logically and the emotions are going their own separate path. Um, it takes a while to get it to where it's like you're kind of drawing it back, and it really is like you're periodically holding onto a rope and you're using all of your gigantic might to pull it apart to get something to go through. It takes a lot of mental strength to do that. And so that's why I would get so frustrated because it would literally be a drain for me to get to suddenly say I'm angry and then the thing would shut close. Just to get me to say that, I'd be like, I'm angry. And then I'll be like, I gotta go to class now. It's just gonna be, I'm gonna be late. You know? uh, 
I know a lot of people who are bipolar who find themselves uh, in the logical processes to be able to pull themselves like out of those types of moods, or at least to be able to see it through those moods. So I guess my question is, to what extent do you think your uh, capacities for logic uh, help guide your emotions, and how much do you think they hinder them? Mm. It's kind of like as I was saying, um, a lot of our, like, I'll make a comment, but the, uh, but the emotions are not directing it. So they're not moving through the same space. The, the, the conversation is not moving through the anger. It's not being drifted towards another direction by it to a certain degree. I mean, it's different than saying, like, I'm not going to listen to you because I'm not just going to pay attention to you anymore. Like, that is kind of a case where you're starting to get frustrated and emotions are starting to affect it and you don't want to care because you're getting mad. But a lot of times, it's like, they're parallel. You're starting to get frustrated, but you're still talking the same way. It'd be as if you had a device that could, like, pick up what the person was saying, and it, if you had a way of telling what words are being affected by emotion, you would find that this is flatlining why this is going up. And eventually, they're just going, one's going straight, the other one's going up or dropping down, but the other one's just staying straight. It's going full-on not being affected by anything. We'll say the exact same information. You are still correct. Yes. I get it. You think that we're being controlled by it, but it was like, no, you are correct. I get it. You know, it's like it's the exact same thing. The emotions sound different, and most people perceive that as being affected, but for us, it's not. Yep. Um, what is your experience with artistic expression? Hmm. Abstraction. Not always easy for us. Um, Dance. Even music? Um, no. Uh, visual stimulation, hmm. uh, once again, is, um, is, is a difficulty. Um, not so much with dance, because that's a bit more kinesthetic. You know, it's like, um, we pick up stuff like that really, really well, because dance, especially dance, has structure to it. You know, it's like, one, two, three, four, pick up routines. When they try to make us learn technique, we're like, eh, boring. <laughs> But when you, when you give us like a set of steps, we can pick it up fast. In, my, like, in the show that I was in with my mother, for example, I was only in three numbers, but I knew ten by heart. <laughs> I could be the other study. <laughs> but I was only in like three numbers, but I knew almost all of the routines by heart. And I was teaching people routines I wasn't going to be in. <laughs> yep? Uh, one thing that I found that was interesting um, that you guys mentioned before is like visual stimuli like the IMAX uh, film was very overwhelming for you and fairs and probably theme parks as well don't really uh, appeal to you. Yeah. But then you also mentioned that you were playing video games with a friend and you seemed to enjoy that and that was a good interaction for you. So I was curious like what, what do you enjoy about video games that you don't enjoy about visual media and uh, what do you find productive about that you find destructive mm -hmm. with the other? It's always a good question, and it ties down to the same exact thing. Um, not all the video games interest us. And, a, and you'll find, you'll start to see where things start connecting with each other, if you pay attention. Like, you'll see, like, for example, um, like, it's a great example. My friend bought a Wii U, my apartment mate bought a Wii U recently when he came back from break. I'm like, oh, now I'm so happy to see you. But, um, before, I'm like, you're coming back? Come on, man. Right. He brought me back and he already has a big gigantic screen TV, so I'm like, happy to see you, come back. Um, but he, had, he bought this like Batman game, and, and for example, like, there's not, like, it was one of those ones where it's like, there's no really direct way to do things, you sort of walk around. That irritates the living crap out of us. Yeah, that's um, what one of the, like, but like, games like Techie and Twisted Metal, like, old games from PS2, like, strategy games that are not too strategy, like still the action that we like is like Roy's that we like the action and stuff, mm -hmm. but has a set way of doing things. So you don't like exploring the crevices of None of like, ways. But yeah. you, like, you like running towards the goal and... Yeah, we were the kind of people who were like, why did you get that bonus point? It was behind through that wall. I'm like, why? Yeah, what's the not point? important. What's the point? It doesn't help me get anywhere, it just gives me more points, and those are just numbers. In Grand Theft Auto, I like doing missions, I just like running around and... I got really into <laughs> it. Like, uh, yeah, I'll fly for a little bit, but if I don't find something that leads me along the right path, I will not bother. I, I, I have a second question, just along yeah. those lines. Um, what else do you enjoy doing in your free time when you aren't studying or working? Or um, what, what do you find pleasing? So I'm not the person who goes out and sees movies. Once again, visual stimulation doesn't matter if it's in 3D or not. Um, I don't find like I'm naturally not drawn to watching movies. Um, but at the same time, like, if I, 
I'll go on, like, I can, I like watching, like, movie, maybe, like, CSI sometimes, because it's like it's a detective, they're looking for clues, they have a set way of following things. Like, I was fascinated by Bones, not just because of her characteristics, but because, like, she had a really set method of going about and doing stuff, and, like, in some of those shows, they're really well defined. Eventually, the Housewives got fascinating, not just because I love watching women who are rich and rich and fighting each other and saying, oh, I can't believe you did this and you cheated on my husband. I'm like, yeah, you cheated on your husband because he was a lot hotter than you. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> but like, it was also because after watching one or two and realizing that they were following the same exact format, a lot of drama, starting to do these things, I was fascinated by that. It was repetitive situations that were the exact same. You would ask for they love that. That fits their structure. So they start getting fascinated by those shows. Introducing it to them, not always easy, because it's a new show. But if you get them hooked on it, if you actually get someone to, like, getting me to try new situations, not so great. But if I do try it and I find that it actually fits all of my structure, I'll be hooked. It takes a lot to get through, but once you do, it's, you're, you're pretty much shut in. Yeah? Um, my question's more for Jess. Um, uh, in the presentation, it said that 95 percent of twins, um, like, have some sort of thing. Identical. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so did you ever see any of these qualities in yourself when growing up? I think I have some, I think I have some issues socially. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I don't think I have any of the other issues like thinking of social cues, um, mm -hmm. as much. Um, yeah, and, like, I don't have any of the sort of, like, interest in like one side I think I hope I don't have like one side I've never experienced people feel that way. Um mom. simply because family was involved. If the person is wrong, they are wrong. And that is my final decision. <laughs> you know, and, I don't, and nothing else can affect it. <laughs> so it helps some situations, because at least I hope that it kind of got you to see sometimes that you had to admit that you were wrong in a situation, because I'm sorry, but not just one person starts it. If the other person's receiving a situation, they are allowing it to happen. Mm -hmm. So they play some part, so they have to sec accept some responsibility, and sometimes she wouldn't. And it's also, and it's really helpful for me. Sometimes I get so I'm like very emotionally driven, and if I'm like caught up in my emotions, which I often do get, I'm like running something over my head. I'll like Elliot will just like light out for me and be like, you don't need to be driven about this. So hard. stop. Like, really stop. Mm -hmm. Get over it. <laughs> Move on. It's life. Um. Yep. Yeah. So I'm curious if you've ever tried to consciously make connections that you know you're lacking in, like say social and emotional situations, and like if so, what like, what your perspective is like through those um, Well, it's like, not every person in a relationship is doing something they truly love themselves, but they're doing it to make the other person happy. It's similar. You know, in my situation, it's incredibly difficult to do that, you know, because I, but at the same time, like, I'm very much like, I like to see as many different angles to a situation as possible. So even though I'm set on one, I do like to look at things in a different way. Um, like, for example, like, even if, like, I'll try to do something to see the other person's side because I don't have the opinion, like, especially these days, not when I was younger. No way in hell you tried to get me to do that, would I even agree with you. But when I was, nowadays, it's like, I purposely try to find, I always say, there's some angle that can work. For example, like, someone tells, like, everybody thinks that, like, the basic class is sometimes off the teachers and stuff like that. I don't. I find, I'm just like, because I know no matter how many times that teacher is going to be a jerk to people, maybe I can find some way to work with them. That was a change, because honestly, if I didn't like a situation and someone told me, I wouldn't bother to do it anyway. Like, especially if it was a social interaction, I was like, well, I'm not even going to bother to talk to that person, because they're clearly going to be a jerk. But nowadays, it's like, I try my best to see an angle. I might be wrong, but I want to be wrong myself, not what other people have to say. Um, and in the end, sometimes it does work. But sometimes I'm like riding it out for a couple hours and I'm just like, 
really doing this, but man, I'm not getting anything out of this. Like, I can't, I'm sorry, call me selfish, but I can't do this no more, even if it makes the other person happy. I'm sorry. I gotta stop, you know. Uh, if that makes sense. Yes? <laughs> You talk about not being able to connect to your emotions. Do you have any connection to your physiological reactions? Like you know, when your limbic system kicks in, you feel your pulse racing, your cheeks So, red. yes. So this is a case where um, if people... Have you ever people heard of what is referred to as being somatic? Um, psychosomatic. Psychosomatic. Mm -hmm. It's essentially, to any people who don't know, um, your emotions take on new forms if they're not necessarily expressed outwards. And so for someone with Asperger's, it does that almost all the time. Because they can't express them in a strong way, and so because of that, it's going to infect. It's, it's like, okay, if it can't go in this route, it's going to go through another to get to you. And it's going to constantly look for a way to get out. Um, and in my case, what ended up happening was it affected primarily my digestive system. Um, and it was like a case where, like, stress would suddenly cause my entire digestive system to go as if for a day, all of a sudden, I was literally vegan because I could not eat anything that was, that was processed or something like that. And it wasn't because I suddenly just decided I was going to become a vegan or I suddenly got allergic. It was just that the emotions literally took such a toll on the system that it virtually changed its entire ability for a moment to, to process anything. Um, Gotten, like, really physically sick. Yeah, I've gotten very physically debilitated for a situation, but my point being that why it's considered somatic is because they run all these tests and they can't figure out a single legitimate medical thing that's wrong. Like they, um, they for a lot of people with autism and Asperger's, they like to take them off of um, gluten and dairy frequently. Except when they tried to do that with me, I became a thin little twig. Um, <laughs> lost a lot of weight, not great. Like, and... Plus we did it for the whole family, so. Yeah, and it was just, it was not right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they hated it. But for example, like, and it was, and this is also sometimes hard for people to understand. Like, my brother especially, like, I will say I can't eat something, and, but then the next day I can, I might be able to eat it, and I won't get sick, and there's no real explanation why. And he, I always remember this one day, because I was like, I can't eat cheese, and then like, within an hour later, he sees me munching on this, like, good. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. I love this. And then he's like, what the hell? You just told me you got sick from eating cheese. And I was like, I'm like, oh, I can't eat cheese. And then you're out on the silent part. It's like, I can't eat cheese. I just like, this thing was just grueling my mind and I could not get over it. And so it suddenly for a moment there was just like, yeah. But then it's like, we're going to go see, like, we're going to go out and do this. And I'm like, sweet. And then I go out there and I have like pizza and I'm fine. You know, and, uh, <laughs> There's some things, there is some things that trigger it a little bit more, um, and I've been able to pretty much narrow them down. A lot of them you guys love, but I can't always have. Uh, <laughs> chocolate, for example, um, beef, uh, a lot of processed food, I can't consume mass amounts of because it's even more temperamental in my system. It already is, because it's just my diet for years, but it gets like, the best reaction I basically, probably everybody here, unless you're vegetarian, loves their bacon. Um, one of American's most popular foods, but for me, a couple times, um, bacon has gone into my system and caused me to have such a bad reaction that I was curling and basically hyperventilating on the floor. Um, it, sometimes the situations are like so bad that it's like it's taking my willpower not to call the hospital because I know in my head that it has absolutely nothing to do with like serious illness. Um, but it's been one of the ones that like I try to avoid, but like. I just had a sandwich at this restaurant with bacon and cheese. Did get sick. But the last time that I had bacon before that, I almost passed out in my apartment um, because the pain was unbearable. And it literally feels like someone stabbing you in the stomach with multiple knives at once and repeatedly doing it. That's how bad it can get. Um, the worst instance, just to put it as perspective for stress related, it's usually stress related. Um, I was, I just moved into a new apartment. I was getting ready. I had all this stimulus to get ready to transfer out of my community college. I just moved into a new apartment. My work situation was going crazy because I was working five days a week, taking five classes, moving to my apartment, having my father up on my ass, having to transfer, get all this stuff ready all at once. All of a sudden, I found that um, I got a bad case of acid reflux to the point where I was having legitimate acid levels rising through my throat. 
and it's not a pleasant feeling. You're like gulping them back down. It's just like, it's literally a burning sensation that's actually traveling all the way up your throat. Mm. I had that for three months straight. Every single day I could I was like, I lost a lot. I lost a decent amount of weight because I couldn't eat meat anymore. I couldn't eat rice. I couldn't eat cheese. I was like eating vegetables pretty much every day, <laughs> every day, like limiting the amount of stuff I could eat was limited and it affected me for three months in a like straight. Every single day was hyper and hyper and hyper. No pills, no medication could solve the problem. They even checked me for heliobacteria, the cause of ulcers, nothing. Um, none of it could be explained. But then in January, everything was back to normal. And I was not stressed, I was having a decent time, it was the last semester, I was enjoying myself, everything went straight back. That's a really harsh example, that's the worst it's ever been. Um, where every day you're waking up and you just have the burning sensation in your body and you can't explain it, nothing can be done. Do you practice any uh, mindfulness meditation, self-regulation, yoga? So this is, that's a great question. Um, is that very challenging? It's become a case where I've found that I've had to make sacrifices, a lot of them, but for not feeling that sensation anymore. Um, I overwhelmed myself last quarter, and my digestive system went into a complete craze where I was doing an internship, I was still doing work, I was doing four classes. It was crazy. Um, I ended up getting like a migraine and nausea in the middle of the midterm and inadvertently it was then that it just, my system went into basically like it's going to shut itself off and I lost like all sense of emotion, all sense of care, all sense of anything for the last like five weeks. Did really well on everything but it was just like I purposely shut everything off. And there's ways to like go about it where I'm just like, I can't do this. You know, there's mind games where you just finally kind of tell yourself, I can't do this anymore. I just have to accept that there's things I can't control if things are going to go wrong. Sometimes your body has to remove itself out of its safety zone to save itself, if that makes sense. It has to shut off things that it values to the death to save its own self from imploding. In my case, you know, it was like I had to cut off a lot of things. I had to cut off a class. I had to cut off... I had to like tell my manager, I'm like, you can fire me, I'm shutting down for one day. Like, and I value work more than anything, and it killed me to have to do that. But it shut off. And I just had to remove things that even I valued to the death. And it saved myself, but it's like, I don't usually have to do that, but like in this case it got so bad that I really had to. And it hurts, and that's something I don't get over easily. Like it took me, like even during finals week, I was frustrated as hell that I had to cut off work so much. Um, like meditation or yoga, uh, not so much. I mean, dance probably helps solve the problem, um, which is what I've been doing more recently. <clears throat> like yesterday, I was so tired because I had a West African dance class on Monday nights and then Tuesday I had contemporary, and I was like, but it was crazy workout. <laughs> yeah, but it really gets rid of a lot. And I thank you, my mother, for actually like putting me in that direction because <laughs> as soon as I found dance, it made the things a lot easier. Um, people have to find their ways of relieving stress, and mine was through the fact that dance was not only movement, but it was movement with structure. It combined two things at once, and so I was finding that I was getting a lot of joy out of it, and it was like, and at five, six, seven, eight at the same time, so I was like, happy little medium. Um, another uh, thing that people might find interesting is that people with Asperger's are kind of immune to bullying because we don't personalize it. <laughs> so you might be calling us, um, like for, for example, like I was diagnosed with Asperger's when I was 10. I came out as a gay man when I was 11, a year after, roughly, to myself at least, and then to everybody else a little bit later. Um, but like if someone were to call me like the F word, like a faggot, I would just be like, well, you're just stating the obvious. What's the point? Like, it's clearly true. Like, I don't get what you're using with that reference. It's like, it's like calling a rock a rock. Do you think that was calling a rock a rock? It's a rock. No more explanation. You know, I wouldn't take the fact that it's meant to be an insult. Or these days I will, but I'll just be like, what are you trying to do? I do. I do. Yeah, I mean, she would take it personally. But like, that itself was like, people could say that. Like, I was on having a lovely conversation with this bus driver. <laughs> I'm like, man, completely random stranger, but we're on a bus, and I'm talking about bus routes, and he loves it, and I'm loving it. There's other <laughs> little old ladies on the back of the bus. It's midnight, like, well, not midnight, but really late at night. 
We're driving all the way down, and I'm continuously talking to him because I love to ramble. Because my stuff's very important. <laughs> I don't give a crap what everybody else has on the bus now. But <laughs> she finally gets off the bus at the last stop, and the first thing she says is, Man, your voice was so loud. You were so annoying. It was awful <laughs> listening to your voice. And then she gets off the bus in a big hug, and the guy's like, I'm so sorry she said that. And all I could just be like, What? <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> and then I get off the bus, and I'm like, Okay, now I gotta get it backward. It's all gonna be good. Let's go home. Like, I didn't even, like, it just, I, it, I was shocked by it, but that's all it could be. You know, it was just, but it was the fact that any, it was, it would have been the same way if someone had got off the bus and suddenly, like, within two seconds had been like, St. Mary! Like, they started singing. It would be the same way. Be no, I'd just, be like, I'd just be like, okay, what's going on? I wouldn't make any emotional reference to the fact that a woman had just told me that I was terrible at something. You could tell me that, and I'd just be like, well, you've got to prove your point. <laughs> Otherwise, you're wrong. <laughs> it's not, I mean, I still get to some degree, it's like we're still affected by things. If someone's yelling at me, I will avoid it. Sometimes that's Asperger's, sometimes I'm just like, this is pointless, why am I bothering to listen to you, you're being really annoying. Or, that's not helpful. Like, really, man, you're being kind of a jerk. I can still do that, but when I was younger, you could say all those things, and I'd be like, I'd be like, they're true, they're wrong. Prove it. But I wouldn't be like, I can't believe you're getting, this is awful, like, why is someone calling me that? This is making me internally just sad. It was just like, well, you're right. I mean, I know I don't walk around and look at everything that all the stereotypes might be having, but you just made a point that is actually correct. So you could go about, and I'm like, why well, didn't, you know, so that was kind of funny. It's like, we kind of, a lot of us, I don't know, I don't know a lot of other people's experience, but from the people that I talked about with Asperger's so far, they've all been like, yeah, we didn't make references to bullying. Someone could tell us that we're too short, and we're like, well, we're short. That is true. <laughs> we can go on, we can, you know, imagine, it's like, imagine, like, a dwarf legitimately, like, who has Asperger's going to prison, like, you're a dwarf, I'm like, they'd be like, well, actually, that's not correct, because dwarves are from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I happen to be very short. So I'm going to correct you on your correctness.